Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. It is my honor and privilege today to welcome our speaker, Dr. Marianne Martone from the FAIR Data Informatics Lab at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Martone received her Bachelor of Arts from Wellesley College in Biological Psychology and Ancient Greek and her PhD in neuroscience from the University of California, San Diego. She is a professor emerita at US, uh, UCSD, but maintains an active laboratory and currently serves as the chair of the University of California Academic Senate Committee on Academic Computing and Communications. She began her career as a neuroanatomist, specializing in light and electron micro microscopy, but her main research for the past two decades has been focused on the informatics associated with neuroscience. She's led the neuroscience informatic, inf, excuse me, the neuroscience <laughs> information framework, the NIF, a national project to establish a uniform resource uh, description framework for neuroscience, and the NIDDK information network, or the DKNet, a portal for connecting researchers in digestive kidney and metabolic diseases to data, tools, and materials. She served for five years as the editor-in-chief of Brain and Behavior, an open access journal, and has just launched a new journal as editor-in-chief called NeuroCommons. Dr. Martone is the past president of the Force 11 Task Force, an organization dedicated to advancing scholarly communication and e-scholarship. She's completed a two-year uh, stint as the chair of the, on the Council of Training, Science, and Infrastructure for the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility based in Stockholm, Sweden, and serves as the chair of their governing board. Since, quote unquote, retiring as an emerita professor at UCSD, she has served as the director of biological sciences for Hypothesis, a technology nonprofit um, de developing an open um, annotation layer for the web, and founded SciCrunch, a technology startup based on technologies developed through the NIF and the DKNet projects. Dr. Martone's lecture today is entitled The Use of Ontologies for Fair Neuroscience. And as always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. If you are watching via YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2021 uh, Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Martone by the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize the questions and I will ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, welcome, Marianne. Thank you so much. We are really looking forward to your lecture. Oh, thank you so much, Jack, for inviting me. And I'm really looking forward to presenting to you on this uh, topic that has occupied me for, as you'll see, many, many years. I just wanted to wave to you live, but then I'm going to turn off my video so you don't have to be distracted by my little moving face. Uh, and let me start my timer to make sure that I don't go over. So, let's see. Oops. I'm in the wrong place. There we go. Okay. So this is not a typo at the top of the slide. I didn't forget to put something in, but uh, I always start, or any lecture that you hear on neuroscience and the data and informatics challenges of neuroscience always starts with some version of this slide. And that's why I put it here. It basically means you know, they will show you all the different scales over which neuroscience needs to be understood from the level of the behaving animal down to uh, the subcellular and molecular level over here, let me minimize this, individual molecules. It talks about the different modalities of data that we need to acquire from light and electron microscopy to physiology traces to behavioral data. So we know that neuroscience data is complex and it therefore presents unique challenges when trying to develop data sharing platforms, data sharing strategies and uh, fair data approaches to neuroscience. So just to summarize, it's a diverse experimental domain with very complex experimental paradigms, has to traverse multiple temporal and spatial scales. There is no dominant model system. People work on all sorts of organisms uh, all over the place, very heavily reliant on spatial information. So imaging, brain atlases, common coordinate systems. And technology and the, the new technology is constantly being developed and the impact of this technology can be transformative in the understanding of structure and function of the brain. So what we know about the brain is very much dependent 
on the techniques that we use to probe it. And when I was in graduate school, one of my professors introduced this phrase uh, of disputed origin, the gain in brain lies mainly in the stain. And what that meant was that if you look at great leaps in neuroscience, uh, such as Cajal's neuron theory, it was really due to different ways of probing the nervous system and being able to uh, visualize them. So for our topic today, uh, which is ontology, uh, the result of the nature of neuroscience, the history of neuroscience, and the heavy technological flux is that there's an extraordinarily large number of vocabularies that people use to describe this organ. So clearly neuroscience needs to be fair, right? If one is going to be able to acquire this data using these different techniques across the globe, no one laboratory or no one group or no one country is uniquely able to acquire all the data that they need, you need to be able to somehow put this data together. And if you want to put this together, data together, of course, you have to be able to find it. You've got to be able to access it. You need to be able to reuse it. And we'd like at some level, if we're going to traverse these scales, to make sure that this data is at least some level interoperable. That is, I can take results that come from lab one, results from lab two, and put them together in some way. Doesn't mean that they're consistent, and that will be a constant theme of my talk. It just means that I at least have a shot at being able to take this data, put it together, and look to see if I can build an integrated picture of the way that the brain works. So I'm not gonna focus on the far parts of FAIR. I'm gonna focus exclusively here on the interoperability part. And if we look at that in more detail, we see that it asks for several things. It asks for metadata and data to use a formal accessible shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Those who know the people who were behind FAIR uh, assume that they're talking about something like RDF, the resource description uh, framework, but in fact, they constantly say that that is not true, that uh, it is agnostic, but it shouldn't be custom and it shouldn't be proprietary. It should be something that is, is available to everyone and that can translate some of these things into a knowledge representation. It should use vocabularies that themselves follow the FAIR principles. And we'll talk about what that means in just a moment. And it should also include qualified references, explicit references, meaningful references to other data. So this idea of being able to link across things means that if I have two pieces of information uh, in two different places, what is the relationship between those? And that should be ideally in a machine computable form. So what is a FAIR vocabulary? Well, essentially it has the characteristics of FAIR data and FAIR data, if I'm sure you're familiar with the principles, have these persistent identifiers, which uniquely identify a particular thing. That unique identifier ties metadata about that thing, whether it's a data file, whether it's a, an article, to that persistent identifier. It has relationships to other things, as we just talked about. And in the realm of uh, computer science and data science, really, uh, these things are characteristic of those structures that we call ontologies and also controlled vocabularies. In its broadest sense, ontologies are representations of human knowledge that are machine computable. At least that's how we use it in data science. And over here, you see an example from a community ontology called Uberon, which is an anatomical ontology. There's a preferred name. It's got an identifier, a full URI. It's got relationships to other things. It's got mappings to other identifier systems. And this would be what we would consider a fair ontology, a, a fair vocabulary, because it is re represented in uh, OWL2, which is a, a, a common interchange language for ontologies that let some sort of reasoning and other operations be performed on this vocabulary. So just again, by way of introduction, what is an ontology? Um, I sort of introduced it already. I assume many are familiar with this, but in its formal definition, an ontology is an explicit formal representation of concepts, relationships among them within a particular domain that express human knowledge in a machine readable form. In philosophy, however, an ontology is a theory of what is. And one of the themes of this talk is a clashing definitions between uh, philosophy of a theory what is with an experimental science like neuroscience, which is we don't know what is, we're still trying to find out, is one of the reasons that it's been somewhat difficult to actually build ontologies for neuroscience. But you can see a simple one over here on the right, brain 
has a part called a cerebellum, it has a part called a Purkinje cell layer, which has a part called a Purkinje cell, which is a type neuron. So basically you have these relationships, these concepts and the relationships between them. And we'd like to say that ontologies, as I'll show in a minute, are uniquely crucial to neuroscience, because if you look at the data types that are associated with neurons and molecules and the data types that are associated perhaps with brain, uh, the only thing that really relates them together in many cases, because you can't always resolve individual neurons in a brain, are these conceptual networks. That is, no single data type has all of this complexity in it at any given time. So they, I think they're unique, neuroscience is uniquely reliant on them, as I'll show you in just a moment. So a lot of my um, introduction to ontologies came uh, through a project called the Neuroscience Information Framework, which Jack mentioned in the introduction. This project's been going on for a long time. It's actually before 2008. I know that you're young faculty, so many of you uh, were probably very young when we started this. And it was an initiative of something called the NIH Blueprint uh, Consortium. These are all the institutes that are involved in neuroscience who actually had been funding a lot of different resources to produce databases and online tools and materials and services. And this predated NIH Reporter, it predated a lot of things that are now available for us to find these things. But basically, it was very difficult to know uh, what resources were out there and available to the neuroscience uh, community. So NIF at its heart was a cataloging exercise, and we maintain a very large catalog of these resources to find out what is being built out there, what domains do they cover, what don't they cover. And it also was an explicit charge for how can we make them better in the future? That is, how can we find these and how can we make them better in the future so that essentially, again, they are fair. So this is just a, a slide, a screen share, screenshot of the current interface of the NIF. It still exists and still goes on. Uh, one thing I do want to just mention is that the technology platform it has is built on has been rebranded SciCrunch. And so if throughout this talk you hear references to SciCrunch, that's what I'm talking about. It's basically the NIFSA technology stack. But it was one of the first attempts to really federate, in quotes, across independently developed, maintained databases and data sources. So it turned out when we did our catalog that there were hundreds to thousands of these databases out there broadly defined in neuroscience, but a lot of them just general biomedicine because everything biomedical is pretty much relevant to each other. And NIF initially was performed in the very much pre-fair uh, state. So there were no standards, there were no desire to develop any standards, and there was certainly no desire to federate. So NIF essentially created an index across data sets as they were, not as we would desire them to be. And of course, you can imagine that was quite difficult. Uh, there's an old saying, the problem is, as I've seen this old saying across multiple domains, that researchers in bioinformatics would rather use somebody else's toothbrush than somebody else's code. I've seen the same thing in molecular biology with gene names, and I've seen the same thing in anatomy in, in terms of anatomical names. And that meant when you were actually going to try to search across these things, every variant of a name that you could possibly think of was there, and every possible synonym for a name was there. So there was very little underlying similarity between different data sources. And how bad was this? I did a little analysis. Uh, NIF at the time had seven databases that contained connectivity information about uh, either primary data or claims from the literature that brain structure A was co connected to brain structure B. And if we looked across these seven sources, there were 1800 unique brain terms. This doesn't include uh, bird brain terms. And if you tried to compare them, that you saw that the number of times that the exact same term to describe a brain structure was present in more than one database was 42. So 42 out of the 1800 unique brain terms had the same exact usage across those. If you added synonyms, there were 99 of them. So some of them was just synonymous. But if you added the first order partonomy matches, you got up to about 400. So what you saw was that people do not use a common terminology to describe the same brain structure, but a lot of times they weren't describing the entire brain structure, they were describing parts of that brain structure, and that that's what those relationships were. So we realized that in order to search NIF effectively, we needed some sort of ontology to sit behind it that would help us navigate these synonyms, it would help us navigate these relationships in order to provide more effective search. 
And we created something called the NIF standard ontology back in 2008. It still exists and is available in BioPortal and through NIF. And it was essentially a collection of community ontologies. These were ontologies that existed out in the community. Uberon we've referenced already, gene ontology you may be familiar with that covered the major anatomical domains. Now, in many cases, they didn't cover neuroscience particularly well. And, uh, but they were a good starting point to say, okay, here's a list of brain regions, here's a list of cell types, okay? And NIF did a lot of work to try to improve the neuroscience coverage in a lot of these as well. So uh, this was used in a back, as a back end to the search in NIF, so that if you search NIF for something like the, called the anterior cingulate area, it would expand into a synonym. Remember, there was no mapping. The people who created this were very reluctant or unwilling to put identifiers into their system, so it was generally free text, and we had to disambiguate a lot of things, but essentially, if you put this in, you would get back um, all the data that referenced one or more of these terms. Now, this wasn't perfect, it was prone to um, a lot of false positives, CGA, for example, is a gene, but it did at least let us query broadly across hundreds of information sources to see what they had about the anterior cingulate. But you might say, and this was a major concern to the neuroscientists, just because they said this was from the anterior cingulate cortex, were they really meaning the same thing? And the answer was almost assuredly not, which I'm going to show you in a moment. But what we tried to convince the neuroscientists was like, look, we're not trying to get to the definitions here. We're just trying to say that if you are claiming that you have something about the anterior cingulate cortex, if you're claiming that you have some data on this or some knowledge about this, we would like to know about it. So we're really not concerned uh, whether or not the usage of the term anterior cingulate cortex was a consistent across these. Rather, we were trying to track assertions about the anterior cingulate cortex. But as I mentioned before, uh, neuroscience has a lot of vocabularies. And part of a, lot, a large region why we have a lot of those vocabularies is because the way that you break up something called the anterior cingulate cortex, or even where it is, is not uh, in great agreement amongst different groups. So this is one of my uh, favorite slides to just illustrate one of the problems. This is a study that is on the prefrontal cortex of the mouse. This is just the mouse, nothing else. It's just one chunk of cortex right in the beginning, right in front of the anterior uh, cingulate, in fact. There are six different parcellation schemes that have been superimposed on this particular piece of tissue based on one single technique six different ones. And if you bother to align them together, you see that they don't really align. They don't use the same vocabulary. The lines don't cross in the same place. And so the relationships between what one person says is anterior cingulate and what its subparts are and what another says is anterior cingulate is very dependent on technique. It's dependent on a whole bunch of different factors, but it is not an exaggeration to say that these don't agree. And this is not people being uh, obstinate. It's that, in fact, we don't know. Everyone who proposed one of these parcellation schemes had evidence that this, in fact, was a, an accurate representation of how you should divide up this area of cortex and how you should define its boundaries, but they don't necessarily agree. So it turns out that in neuroscience, that's true for a lot of our knowledge, what you would consider fundamental knowledge. So you might think that by now, since we the concept that neurons uh, are the cell types of the nervous system has been around for 100 uh, some odd years, that we would understand how many neuron types are in the brain. But in fact, this was an announcement of the NIH or the US Brain Initiative back in 2014 uh, and one of the things they said was the mammalian brain contains, contains a vast number of cells. They're generally grouped by broad classes, but it is currently unknown exactly how many classes exist. So in fact, when people disagree about what cell types comprise a region, again, they're not being just obstinate. It's that we honestly don't know. So if you're going to take knowledge about a domain and formalize it, it would help that you understood what knowledge you were actually formalizing. And what we learned over the years when we were trying to use uh, common procedures that were in place for building very successful ontologies like the gene ontology was that they really didn't work because that sort of what they normally do is they would get a bunch of experts in the room and everybody would agree that these were the brain regions and this is how they were organized. And 
no amount of sitting in a room trying to gain consensus on a cell type or brain region is going to work. We've tried, we've tried for many years. And that's because again, it's simply not known. It's not that there is not shared knowledge. So the fact, if you look at the neuroscience literature, you will see things like pyramidal cell and you'll see things like anterior cingulate cortex. It just doesn't go very deep. So we have a shared conceptualization of neuroscience. We can talk to each other. We can teach neuroscience to each other. But if you then try to go into the particulars, you find that these more granular concepts, which are really critical for annotating experimental data, are almost completely reliant on specific experimental techniques. And even then, as in the case of the missile, they may not be adequate to get to anything that we may consider ground truth. There may not be a ground truth. I think we have to also, you know, kind of. Uh, a grapple with that. So in, when NIF was going ahead and trying to build these ontologies, we really, uh, we, we started to understand that the typical way of doing this was not going to work and something that was much more flexible and respected the fact that ontology, that neuroscience was really an experimental domain. We were on the cutting edge of trying to figure out how this tissue was organized was needed. So in the next part of the talk, I'm going to go through uh, the strategies and infrastructures that we've developed over the years for using and building in neuroscience ontologies and how they are being applied now across three projects. The first is the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. These are the groups of neuroscientists who are trying to use cutting edge techniques to gain a handle on how many cell types are there. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how we're representing neuron phenotypes uh, using ontologies as a way to translate between experimental science and general knowledge. I'm going to talk about the Stimulating Peripheral Activity to Relieve Conditions, or SPARC project. Uh, this is a large project that's trying to map the autonomic nervous system, and we're using and extending anatomical ontologies uh, across data models and circuitry diagrams to build a cohesive platform and a large knowledge base. And if I have time, I'll get into the Reprenim project, which is a reproducible neuroimaging and their concept of federated data elements. I understand that if I don't get to Reprenim, David Kennedy, who leads that project, is coming soon. So he will be able to pick up where I left off. So let's start with the neuron phenotype ontology, or as I like to say, how to have fair disagreements. Uh, this is really the work of Tom Gillespie, who was a graduate student in my lab, and Sean Hill, our colleague at the Blue Brain Project. And uh, it was designed again to have a, to deal with this fact that since we don't know how many cell types there are in the nervous system, how do we gain some traction on representing and translating amongst the different classification schemes that have been generated? So if you look at neuron classification schemes, this is where somebody goes into a brain region and based on some set of properties says, well, I think that there's five, five major cell classes. The problem of GABAergic interneurons in the cortex, which is just one region of the brain, has literally generated in the last few years dozens and dozens of different classification schemes that have been proposed for them. They usually measure a set of, process, of, of properties, a lot of experimental data. They distill that down into some sort of proposal, which is usually presented as a table. And of course, everybody has its own table we know that some of these are due to experimental uh, artifacts or the fact that group A measured these sets of phenotypes and group B measured these sets of phenotypes. But we'd like to think that inside of all this data, it is trying to come to the conclusion that there are in fact discrete cell types that transcend any one of these techniques, right? Some sort of universal knowledge about this. But again, the way that this data is typically published, and this is meant to overwhelm and confuse, is that you distill down all this different experimental data that you see, you get this table, and then you're supposed to be able to compare across these tables. I can't think of anything more unfair than the way that we currently communicate about cell types in the nervous system. So the neuron phenotype ontology was designed uh, as a common data model for expressing neuronal types as extension collect extensible collections of phenotypes, essentially taking those tables and turning it into something that is interoperable according to the fair data principles. And the way that we had to do this was sort of abandon uh, a realist perspective on the fact that there is a neuron and there's only one type of neuron, we're trying to get to those types that they're talking about here and just recognize that a lot of times all we have are classes of neurons that are a bunch of phenotypic properties. So we basically decided to embrace the reality 
uh, of, the, of the way neuroscience is done instead of the way that we were taught to develop ontologies, which means I have to tie very closely to some universal realistic perspective of what's there. So neurons themselves are modeled as bags of phenotypes. These phenotypes come from major ontologies. So they have identifiers, they're fair, they're species, there's anatomical, molecular, morphological, physiological. But we define two different types something that we call common usage type, which is typically the thing that's covered in an ontology. These are things that have been studied by hundreds of uh, labs over the years. They are recognized across multiple species. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether you use a particular technique. There are multiple techniques that allow you to develop them. So they've really passed into common knowledge. But we distinguish that with what we call these evidence-based models or evidence-based types. And these are ones that, again, represent what you saw in the previous slides. These are groups of people, usually sets of experiments or projects that have employed a set of set techniques. They've gone ahead and created a classification scheme and they want to uh, communicate that. And the evidence-based type, again, differs in several fundamental ways from the common usage type. The common usage type is generally species and uh, species independent. That is, you will find them across multiple species. A pyramidal cell is a pyramidal cell is a pyramidal cell, and you see it across multiple species. They typically, again, come from a specified source, which is a laboratory or project, so you can trace the provenance back to an individual group, whereas you can, for some of these common juices types, say the first person who described it, but they generally didn't describe it in totality, right? This represents the general work of the community to understand what this common juices type is. It always comes from a specific species and strain because that's what that group has studied. So it's tied very closely to an individual uh, uh, species. The class definitions are driven by data. They've actually been uh, collecting data on this. And what we've done is we've taken a set of Python scripts and, that allow you to take the phenotypes that have been uh, collected by that laboratory that would be in that table and turn that into a more formal representation using OWL semantics, the web ontology language, that actually relates those phenotypes to individual ontologies through their identifiers. So it says, you can say whatever you want about this. We will give you something that lets you uh, convert your uh, names into OWL statements. So this is all done automatically through Python. And then we can generate automatically a consistent naming scheme for these neurons based on these phenotypic properties, uh, which right now looks like this just long string, almost like a gene sequence of all of the different pheno phenotypical characters that go into defining this neuron class. So you see species, anatomy, morphology, electrophysiology. And this is all done automatically. Again, nobody needs to do anything. So this differs from a lot of the ways that common naming schemes are put in where you get agreement from a group of experts that say, this is how you're going to name it. And then you manually go and follow that scheme. These are all done automatically and handled through the ontology. So these evidence-based types tie very closely to what it is that the experimentalists reported. And that means that if you actually look at these names in their reality, they can be quite messy. So these are all the same entities that are color-coded according to different uh, schemes, Josh Wong, Henry Markram, Alan Brain. And S1 is the primary somatosensory cortex. It's called neocortex in Wong. It's primary visual cortex here that comes from a specific atlas in the Allen. Uh, this one is our common usage type, which says, well, generally these cells are found in neocortex layer two and three. And you can see that all of them seem to have something to do with the neurotransmitter GABA, but this one has GABA receptors, this one has GABA channels, this one has the actual neurotransmitter GABA, and so on and so forth. So when you look at the terminology that happens amongst the different labs, you can see that there's a lot of variation and to relate this requires a lot of human knowledge. And that's really what the neuron phenotype does. That's the benefit of turning this into that formal representation. It essentially takes all of those different brain regions, for examples, whether they're specific instances of a parcellation scheme or whether they're generic concepts like neocortex, it relates those together. It takes all the different ways you could represent a molecular species to say that this is, for example, a somatostatin neuron. And it says, if you have any of these and you have any of these, then you're considered a cortical somatostatin neuron. So it basically 
allows you to express that complexity, but then it does reasoning on top of that to collapse it down to its universals. So if you want to say find all somatostatin containing cortical neurons, it can do that. It can pull all these things out regardless of the local terminology, and it does this through these ontological structures. So the same practice that we used for relating experimental types and common usage types in neurons is also something that we did to handle all those different parcellation schemes. We basically introduced two different types of anatomical structure. One is equivalent. It's a common usage brain region. It's a brain region that we all talk about. It uh, is in anatomy textbooks, but essentially it's stateless and spe it's stateless and species independent. So you can find anterior cingulate in a whole bunch of species. Stateless, I mean that it it corresponds to a specific region of brain. If you're taught neuroanatomy, it'll tell you where it is, but the boundaries of it are only generally defined in specific experimental techniques. So when we say anterior cingulate and you say, what do you mean by anterior cingulate? We can say, well, we can't tell you without additional data. All we know is it's roughly here, but we contrast that to the parcellation schemes which again are like these experimental based types. These are tied to specific species and representations and they generally have atlases and borders that are associated with them. So the provenance of that usage is very clear. If I say neocortex, you only have a general sense of what I mean. If I say M1 according to X, then you know exactly what I mean. So we've kind of again uh, created this sort of dual branches, one more conceptual and general and universal, and one that's very much specifically tied to these specific artifacts. So this has been a, a very useful exercise. It's still in its early stages, but we've already been, to, been able to show that it does help translate, for example, between phenotypes coming from uh, the HBP, the Human Brain Project, and Blue Brain Project in Europe, and those that are coming from uh, the brain initiative. And it lets you essentially express all those complex phenotypes in a common language, which lets you compare them. And again, we make no statements about whether these are the same neurons or not. We merely say that they share or they don't share features and we leave it up to the experimentalists to argue about that. But at least again, they can look at all the data as you remember in the beginning that would let them try to answer this question instead of having to navigate all that themselves. So I'll skip that one there. Uh, so the next one uh, that I'm going to talk about is anatomical vocabulary services in the SPARC project. And this again is uh, Tom Gillespie and my colleague Bernard de Bono, de Bono and Monique Sorlis Ziegler, who's a postdoc in my lab. And the SPARC project, um, just to give you some introduction to it, is uh, all about being able to use neuromodulation, that is sticking electrodes and various uh, devices into peripheral nerves to be able to relieve a variety of conditions. Um, they've been sticking electrodes in and claiming all kinds of effects if you stimulate the vagus. But it was uh, realized again that we actually knew relatively little about the autonomic nervous system. We've had general maps for a hundred years, but we don't really know the detailed trajectories that these different nerves take. So the idea of SPARC is that it is supposed to put neuromodulation therapy or bioelectronic medicine, as we call it, on a much firmer experimental uh, basis by developing a huge knowledge base, set of data and uh, connectivity maps that are directly targeted to the autonomic nervous system. So this is being done through something called the SPARC Consortium. There are well over 60 labs, 500 individuals or so that are participating. And they're basically creating maps of connectivity and physiology across 15 different organs and systems. All of this data is being made available to something called the Spark Data and Resource Center, of which we are a part. And uh, you can go to the Spark portal and actually start to find this data and see what it is that has been done. I could spend an entire lecture on this, but I'm going to go through it relatively quickly and focus more on the back end of how we're using anatomical ontologies to help enable all of the things that Spark needs to do. So one of the big things that Spark is producing are these connectivity maps. It has an interactive interface which shows the individual nerves that connect different parts of the organs. These, these things are all connected to data sets. They're mapped to the 3D scaffold it's a, and also simulation uh, platforms. Underlying these lines is actually a very sophisticated model, which plots not only that structure A connects to structure B, 
but also the trajectory it takes so that you know what nerve bundle it goes through, what anatomical structures it goes through, so that if you are placing electrodes, you would get a sense of what the local tissue environment is. That information is not available through this interface, but it is being made available through a knowledge base of ANS circuitry uh, that is using a very sophisticated model. You can see that down here, how precise the different uh, pathways are and which, which structures they traverse. And this, uh, we're creating a semantic knowledge base that contains this information. And I'd love to talk to you about this, but uh, we're not yet up to our first release. So I'm not really going to talk about this in too much um, detail. But this is a place where we're really using the full reasoning power of ontologies and full representation to create a very sophisticated uh, knowledge base. Instead, I'm going to talk about the fact that because Spark is producing so many different things, it's producing flat maps, it's producing 3D scat folds, it's producing uh, data sets, uh, that having consistent anatomical annotation across these things and across the 500 people who are involved in Spark is really quite critical for it to be successful, right? You want people to be able to pass easily from one representation to the next, and you want them to be able to uh, understand exactly what it is that they're looking at when they see these structures. So we are putting Spark from the get-go on a firm ontological backbone. Uh, we're using a community ontology called Uberon, supplemented by the foundational model of anatomy for human terms as our annotation framework. But as I mentioned before, those ontologies tend to be fairly coarse and they don't get down to the level of detail that one needs if you're producing this type of detailed anatomical data and these, and these detailed root maps. So one of the challenges that we've had is how we go about allowing this fair annotation to happen without being constrained by what's available through these community ontologies. So one of the things that we did was we've incorporated these ontologies into the main segmentation tools and annotation tools that are being used. This is actually a tool that's produced by Micro Brightfield or former Micro Brightfield MBF Bioscience, which lets people contour and uh, do these detailed delineations of their data sets. These are all lists of anatomical terms. Here's metadata about the species that is being used. But if you actually look behind the scenes, that's actually translating this information into uh, identifiers. And so that mapping is happening automatically when the researchers are annotating, they don't need to do anything afterwards. The problem is, of course, is then they get deep, deep in here, as I mentioned, they may encounter a structure that isn't in the ontology. So what do we do in that case? Well. The NIF project, SciCrunch, you can see again both of these terms in here, actually maintains an infrastructure that allows people to on the fly add terms to a database called Interlex, receive an identifier, and then later on do the knowledge engineering to relate that to other terms or even contribute them back to different ontologies. So essentially when people are annotating, if there's a new term, it gets added to Interlex it then gets its identifier, they're free to annotate with it. And as I'll show you, we have a review process later to sort of see how well that goes. Um, the full ontology is served through something called a SciGraph, which is a Neo4 based, uh, Neo4j based system. Uh, you can either access Interlex or SciGraph uh, through services if you want to incorporate this into, again, an annotation workflow like you saw with the MBF tool. So just to look at Interlex a little bit more, it's essentially an online lexicon or dictionary of biomedical terms. It largely draws those terms from community ontologies that exist already, maintaining the identifiers and some of the relations. It doesn't have all of them, but it has some of them. But its main power is that users can add, link, and modify metadata within Interlex. So they can add their own terms, they can change definitions, they can do all of that. Basically, they can do with the ontologies what they want to do. And all of this is captured in um, versioning number and provenance so that essentially it becomes a sort of a living laboratory of what people want to do with these concepts. It's really designed to provide the necessary coverage for this type of deep annotation of experimental data uh, without at the same time, we contribute to community ontologies, but we don't have to wait to submit those terms, wait for it to be approved, and so on and so forth. Neither, if you're doing experimental data, even though a lot of ontologies have term request pipelines, you may have to use 
ontologies, four or five different ontologies when you're annotating a single data set and you don't want to have to go to four to five different uh, term requests. So it's um, a very sort of powerful system, but it's again designed to serve as the interface between the experimentalist and these community ontologies. So just to look in a little more detail, each term is assigned a, a, a uniform resource identifier, so a full URI. It's mapped to other terms if they exist. It's tagged with who it is contributed. It can be related to different terms if you wish. Those can come in through bulk upload or you can add them yourselves. There's a commenting thread on each one of them that can be used for discussion. And it has some curatorial tools. So if, for example, like Spark, there's an approval process for something to be used or approved for the Spark vocabularies, there are a set of uh, curation tools that people can use to uh, say, yes, this has been approved or no, it hasn't. Again, everything gets in, not necessarily everything gets approved. So how does that approval process work in Spark? We actually do maintain something called the Spark Anatomical Working Group. These are a set of independent experts, anatomical experts who serve as consultants to Spark. Uh, currently, they're Gary Ma and Jerry, Jackie Bresnahan, plus a network of experts. Every new term that's submitted to Spark gets reviewed by SOG. It's not a matter of them rejecting or accepting them. It is a quality control review, however. So for example, we had one term that was used to annotate data called the thoracic ANZA. It was brought to the SOG and they said, we've never heard of this term and we have no idea what they mean. We went back to the investigator and they said, oops, that's actually a mistake. That's not what it should have said. So it was able to actually correct a, a, an error, which is a, very important. There are other areas where they suggest terms where one said they wanted to call it empty area. And we said, does this refer to extracellular space? The investigator said, no, no, this is a fixation artifact. So we said, well, actually this might be a better term and they were willing to use it even if they had used it as a synonym, right? We would have had that mapping. But essentially, again, this is not that sort of consensus driven process. This is just a review for clarity. Sometimes we get terms and the the experts say, you know what, that really should be an Uberon. Uh, and we recommend that we, we go, then go through and we submit it to Uberon so that we build up their representation of the peripheral nervous system. So essentially what we've done in Spark is we've implemented the infrastructure and a workflow and a process for both being formal about what it is that we use in our annotations, but giving the flexibility to build content area that is not yet in community ontologies and also those very detailed uh, structures that often are, are necessary for annotating experimental data that really don't belong in community ontologies. For example, we get a lot of junctions between two structures. And, and it goes through again, this process of approval, everything gets in to Interlex, so it's available for use, but only some things get into the Spark ontologies, which get built into NIF some of them go to Uberon and so on and so forth. So this is how we balance the need for formalism with the flexibility that we need for uh, experimental neuroscience. And it looks like I have a few minutes to go through a reprenym, so I will do that. And again, I think you'll hear a little bit more about this from David Kennedy. So this is a reprenym, which is a Center for Reproducible Neuroimaging Computation. My colleagues, uh, David Kennedy, Jeff Greta, Sacha, Dave, and Yar Yarek are all listed below, and they all know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, I do, uh, I am involved, but uh, not as heavily as uh, these gentlemen. And essentially, as you'll hear about, reprenym is again, really geared towards data, and it's geared towards making uh, the process of acquiring and analyzing neuroimaging data much more reproducible. So they cover the main areas, study design, data collection, data processing, statistical analysis, and publications. They provide details on how you can do this in a much firmer computational footing and a much fairer way than we typically do it right now. But one of the things that's sort of integral to Reprenim is this idea of annotation, right? That annotation of metadata, all experimental details do need to be annotated. And the more they are done so in a fair way, the more that metadata is available for downstream analysis and comparison. So annotation is very, very critical to this entire process. 
They are, and what are they annotating to? Well, there is a, a core vocabulary. I think Jack was involved in this called the NIDM, Neuroimaging Data Model. I should say a data model. And that has data set descriptors. It deals with experiments, workflows, results. It also has a vocabulary that can be used to uh, describe these things and annotate these things. It's based on something called PROV, which is a, a W3C standard for looking at provenance. You can see what that looks like right over here. And it's a very sophisticated and uh, fairly complex model that serves as one of the back ends for the reprenim strategy. So I'm not going to go too much into what it is that reprenim does in terms of their technology stack. But one thing is clear, right, that there needs to be a robust annotation framework. This crosses everything, all right, that one does. This is the annotation. And you can see here that they also are using the Interlex system in order to balance this need for formalism with the need to be able to add things as needed in these very complex and often customized uh, workflows. So it's the same infrastructure that we're using for Spark. One of the outcomes of all of this annotation is that they are building uh, a data lake, which is a public repository that will have all of this annotated data in it. They also allow researchers to develop their own local data stores. But just as with the other contexts that we've seen, um, neuroimaging is characterized by a lot of different packages. There's a lot of software that's out there. There's a lot of customized routines. So FSL and ANTS and FreeSurfer and all of these different things are built into uh, different workflows. So these are all being mapped into uh, NIDM. And one of the things that, one of the places where ontologies are really coming into play is in essentially annotating the data elements that are produced by these different packages. So that's what I'm gonna focus on for the last part of this talk. So if you look at um, common data elements, there was a big push at NIH to create common data elements for different types of things. Um, there are data elements that actually come out of these packages. So there's a tool called FreeSurfer and it measures the caudate nucleus, the left caudate nucleus volume. So it basically, if you run that package, you will get a chunk of tissue that corresponds to the left caudate nucleus according to FreeSurfer. Uh, you'll get the same thing if you use a package called ANTS. One of the things that Jeff Greta and Dave Keeter have done is they basically are taking these common data elements and they're turning them into what are called community data elements. So they're taking the different pieces of these data elements and mapping them to ontological concepts that are relevant. So for example, the caudate nucleus from Uberon, the left side, which is laterality, the units from the unit ontology. So they're creating these sort of semantic data elements that are coming from this. So that means that the, that the ants and FreeSurfer are both now expressed in the same common language, one that is fair and therefore computable and formalizable. So that's one step. The second step, which I think is rather neat, is that they've introduced the concept of something called a federated data element. So you can take these community data elements that have been mapped to these formal concepts and now say that there does exist something called left caudate nucleus volume. And that can be expressed in FreeSurfer, that can also be expressed in ANTS. Again, we know that there are differences in the way that these things are defined, and we know that there's differences in the way, um, and probably disagreements in the way that are, and, and also measured, right? So these two things may not be equivalent, whoops, I'm getting to the end here, but at least you have, an, uh, you have the chance of understanding that the left caudate nucleus has been measured and the provenance of that is clear through these deep semantics. So I hope you can see that um, this is a use of ontology, again, not to drive consensus, but just to express and reveal what is in the latent tools in a way that is interoperable. So actually, this is good timing. Where are we now compared to 2008 when all young and fresh, we decided that we would be able to go out and create ontologies for neuroscience? Well, I think that there are several things that are in our favor now. Neuroscience is going, I would say, slowly towards FAIR, but FAIR is tough, so that doesn't surprise me. But groups that never before cared about data standards or vocabularies are now starting to talk about them. Those who are developing the brain archives, for example, like Satrajit Ghosh, uh, are using ontology identifiers in their data models so that, again, the problems that NIF had in the beginning 
will not be solved, but they will be less. <laughs> okay, so I think this is finally permeating the mindset of a lot of people doing neuroscience. But the process that we've built, the models, the infrastructure uh, for working and building fair vocabularies, we really implemented a process that we believe is suitable for experimental neuroscience. It lets the experimentalists work where they are, provides these translation services, and formalizes knowledge about the, the universals that we share in neuroscience and doesn't worry so much about these other uh, leave notes because those are at the cutting edge and those are tied to specific data and data sets that we hope will also be fair so that we can start to examine these concepts and say, do they have any validity or not? We're not telling them yes or no. So we don't, you notice in this at any point insist, insist on consensus. At no point do we have everybody in the room agreeing on anything. Rather, we align this common knowledge ourselves with more experimental concepts to promote search and interoperability. So the good news is, is I think we are really getting some traction, but also we still believe very strongly in these community ontologies, they're very valuable. And so all of our efforts are enriching these with neuroscience content and terms, though using a bottom-up approach instead of top-down. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. Marian, thank you so yes. much. That was, uh, uh, it's always interesting whenever I have students come to me and they, I say, well, what do you want to do when you, you know, in neuroscience? And they say, oh, I want to understand the brain. Right. And I think just, <laughs> if you just kind of watch a talk by Marianne Martone, it'll uh, give you a, 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 an understanding of the hill you're going to be climbing. <laughs> uh, it's, it is a complex beast. I, you know, you, in your talk, which was fantastic, by the way, and you covered so much ground, I think everybody appreciates that you really kind of made the linkage between this kind of just natural linkage between brain science with all of its different terms and it's all these different levels of granularity and ontological sciences mm -hmm. um, and how that relates to you know how you can promote fairness. I'm kind of curious what you view as the connection to what we now think of as data science. We must yes. once called it kind of informatics, but now it's really data science. Where, where's that connection, the computational element of things? Oh, I have my marvelous quote somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. I'll just put this up because this is one of my favorites. I didn't know if I would have time to get to it. So you do see these two strains, right? Which says, well, I've got all this data. All I need to do is put this data together and I'm going to find new things. And I really don't need these concepts, right? These concepts aren't really necessary because I'm going to be able to look for data signatures and everything I need is in the data. And I, I saw this wonderful blog a few years ago and I, I, I took the concepts from it where they, they contrasted the semantic idealist with the chaotic nihilist, right? <laughs> 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 and so, you know, the idea, and they said, these are big data's odd couples, right? These, she's abandoned any hope of properly tagging the world and relies on machines to find the most relevant or appropriate information. Her kind are the machine learning data scientists who are convinced that given enough data and the right algorithm, the best results will bubble to the top. Uh, and, you know, you, you contrast that with sort of the ontological world is the semantic idealists who fetishize taxonomies, we have to tag and organize it all. And I think we all recognize that there's an interplay between these two. So, um, you know, I always say render unto semantics what goes to semantics and render unto data what goes to data. And I think one of the problems that the when I was first interacting with the ontology community is their idea of data was very different than mine. Their idea of data was this distilled knowledge that was inside of papers. And I said, no, 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 what we're talking about is data is this, right? <laughs> these are the numbers and these are the measurements. And ideally you want these two to agree. And that's why I emphasize now assertions. So when I take something like this and I assert that it is something that we would consider a universal, right? Something that we understand, you would ideally like to be able to say that I have asserted that this thing is an X. So I've asserted that this is a mitochondria in a, in a, you know, a gene network. But you would also like the gene network to have some validity that this is a mitochondria, right? That it basically says, oh, look, right? I've localized this to mitochondria and this one has DNA sequences that are, have been in the past associated with, with mitochondria. So I find that this sort of back and forth, you're still gonna have to take all this, right? And you're still going to have to conceptualize it because that's how human beings communicate with each other. That's how we understand. But you really want them to work in tandem and you don't want to force one structure into the other. Let data handle what data handles, 
let these assertions handle what they uh, what they handle. They handle making it easy to search because even though everybody wants the algorithm that's going to go across the web and find data signatures right now, that's extremely difficult to do. So if you are going to search, you're going to put in a term, right? You're going to say, this is what I'm trying to find. But if we get hung up that those terms are accurate and all encompassing, we're never going to get anywhere, right? To me, these two things come together. So I assert that those yellow dots are about something that I know. And in the future, you would like to make sure that anytime you see that pattern of yellow dots, that it is tied with that assertion. Mm -hmm. So as somebody said once, I think it was Jeffrey Builder, who's from Crossref, he said, uh, if I assert that I'm Marianne Martone, that's one thing, and most of you will believe me, and I say that I work at UCSD, you'll say, okay, that sounds reasonable. If you then go to a database at UCSD and they say, oh yes, here's Marianne Martone identified by her ORCID and she does in fact work here, then that is a much stronger right, <laughs> bit mm -hmm. of evidence than just say so. So I believe that these assertions, again, provide us a way of communicating about meaning. They help in search, but ultimately you want them all to be able to agree with each other. So that's why I, I really emphasize that if I go to five different databases with five different bunches of yellow dots and they're all in different places and mitochondria is scattered throughout, it means I probably don't understand what a mitochondria is and I certainly can't recognize it in data. There's no consistency there. Let's, let's contrast that, right, where I say, oh, I go to five different databases, they all have annotations on mitochondria and when I combine those data together, they're all pretty close. You know, we're going to get 100%, but they're pretty close. That suggests that the concept of mitochondria has some validity in a bunch of different experimental contexts, and that therefore it's a good thing for us to, you know, build our theories on top of it. So I think that, you know, really what I'm, I'm, I'm advocating is to use them where they're appropriate, but not to worry again about saying, oh, this is exactly in the right place of the hierarchy. It's just meant to be... Uh, a way of us to formalize our shared understanding of what all this data means. I don't know if that answered your question, but. I think so. The, I, I mean, love one, this slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's very good because yeah. it, it's it, it actually, yeah. your comment leads me into a, mm -hmm. another question of, you know, these databases that, and uh, these various mm -hmm. things like the Interlex tool, for example, seems like a very powerful framework. Um, to what degree does it interact with things like um, OMOP or OHDSI that are databases uh, in the clinical space. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> so currently we sort of sit in the basic science spaces yes. and um, we, we do not interact with them, um, but there's no reason why it could not, right? It's no reason why the approach, it, it can ingest anything and anyone can ingest what we have because just need to make the linkage huh? you just need to make the linkage yeah okay uh, one final thing and I, I always kind of use this as a joke when I'm mm -hmm. giving a presentation on it is when I discuss the fair principles yes. I say that uh, fair uh, it's unappreciated but fair has a silent e on the end and yes. that e <laughs> stands for education or educational uh, yes. in that uh, it can be findable accessible interoperable mm -hmm. reusable and educational do you find that there is um, a role for fairness in education both kind of uh, on the giving end and on the receiving end if you know what i mean yes so actually I gave, a, we had a summer of data program through UC, uh, through DKNet, where uh, we take in student interns and instead of doing data science, which is what they expect, we do data fundamentals like data management, <laughs> fair mm -hmm. data and all the things that are necessary. So one of the sayings that I have is, you know, you have to prepare to share and you have to prepare to share fair uh, because it requires effort on your part and that fairness can be sharing just with, or that sharing can be just with your colleagues or your PI, or it can be with the world in general. But I was very surprised in all the lectures, the one that the students liked the most was the FAIR lecture I gave, mm. because I think it started them to sort of think about again, data as more of a primary product of their research and not the thing that you munge and discard and then move on to the next. And so I think it put data management into a context that says, well, what am I supposed to do in terms of managing my data? It's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, you need to make it understandable. You need to make it understandable to a human, 
But here is an example, and I use a lot of specific examples of this is what's in your lab notebook. This is a shorthand. Are you going to know what that shorthand means? Actually, the shorthand is a mouse that is from a, a catalog, and you can use a research resource identifier to put that in, and then you can use whatever shorthand you want. So I think in terms of understanding what it is that you're trying to achieve when you're managing your data, it's very powerful. At the same time, just like with ontologies, I believe in what I call the fair handshake, right? You don't have to do everything. You have to understand that if you really want to achieve fairness, you're going to likely hand it over to a data repository or a data archive that's going to do some of the other work for you. So you don't have to do everything. Your job is to get it here. I don't know of any student who doesn't appreciate when I show them you know, examples of data with rich metadata and data without rich metadata saying, which one would you rather try to grapple with, right? <laughs> and they all go to the one with rich metadata. They're like, well, this one's much better, right? This one is much better. And so I think it both promotes their reuse because a lot of the ones that have no metadata, they can't find it, they can't open it, they don't know who did what, they see that that data is fundamentally unusable, whereas over here, where and students are, I think, are, are really reliant on using other data in many cases because they're doing short lab rotations, they have to do research projects, they don't always get to generate all their own. So I, I do think it goes both ways, and it's a powerful framework for understanding what we're trying to achieve, even though there's many ways to do it when we're managing our data and then making it available. Marianne Martone, thank you so very much for sharing uh, this fantastic tour of informatics of ontology design for, for brain science and just trying to get it organized. Uh, that yes. is a hero's <laughs> amount of work, I have to say. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us. Um, everyone have a, mm -hmm. a great weekend. We will see you all next week. Uh, in the meantime, uh, here on the East Coast, uh, we're digging out from a snowstorm. And uh, for those of you who are also <laughs> digging out, uh, good luck. Uh, enjoy your weekend. We'll see you soon. It's, uh, it's uh, 80 degrees here. Oh, okay. very... yeah. <laughs> no, so, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> in, in Southern California, it is. Yes, exactly. Anyway. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.